Good morning, church. Welcome to worship at the Cargill United Methodist Church, and we welcome those who are worshiping with us online, whether it is live with us on this Sunday morning or sometime later. We are glad that you are with us, and we are glad that we can worship together from wherever we are this day. I want to welcome the family of Ada Laskowski, who is just paying such rapt attention in the front row. Yes, we will see each other in just a few moments. I want to welcome her extended family as we celebrate her holy baptism today. I want to take this opportunity to welcome any other guests who are in our midst. We are grateful that you have found your way to the Cargill Church and hope that you experience God's hospitality and welcome as you come to worship this day. We continue to adapt to a post-COVID worshiping world, and we are uh, now inviting your congregational singing. And so uh, when it comes time for our songs this morning, we invite you to stand when those happen and to sing. Uh, you will find the lyrics for all the songs on the slides behind me and in front of you. All of the worship books are also included in your pews. If you would be uh, desiring to, uh, to do that as well, you may worship in whatever way helps you connect with God on this day. We want to remind you that we have also reinstated our free nursery and child care, which is down the hallway that way toward the west entrance. And you may bring to, uh, young children there for staffed free nursery care at any time you might need during the service. You know, we come this place to this place today to worship in this sanctuary of the Cargill Church, a very familiar place for many of us, for some of us, perhaps the first time we have ever been here. But we know that people worship in places as varied as old schools and uh, converted basketball arenas and storefronts, cathedrals and country churches. So what is it about where we worship that matters most to God. What does it mean to be the dwelling place for God? Is the church really God's house? We pray to hear the word of God as we worship this day. Please join with me in the opening prayer. Lord, we gather here this morning with lives that are filled with activity and movement. We rush from one thing to another as though we are going to run out of time to accomplish everything. Help us to let go of the hectic times and the stresses and find our rest in you. Reflect our spirits and refresh our souls. Remind us that there will always be things to do and places to go, but that we need the rest of a spirit that you provide. Amen. So how do you describe church? A church is a place we come for a holy baptism. Is, is church a thing that you do? Is it a, a place you go to? Is the church the people you have gathered with? We know that you can come together in many different places and call it church, and they look very different, don't they? For example, one of the first churches that I served, it was part of a three-point charge, uh, and, and this was in Anson Township outside of Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. And as you can tell, it's a beautiful little country church. It was, sits on a, a, a country intersection. At one point, there was a general store, there was an auto repair shop, and there was a school, and there was a church. The church is the only one that's left. Um, it was a beautiful setting for a Christmas Eve service at 11 o'clock on Christmas Eve in a, in a charming little church that was full when it had 45 people sitting in it. When our daughter, uh, oldest daughter, was looking to get married in her hometown of Normal in Bloomington, Illinois, uh, there were several churches that we looked at there, and, and this was one of them. It's Hope United Methodist Church on the outskirts of, of Normal, Illinois, and it looks nothing like the little Anson church we just saw, does it? 
Uh, when we first saw it, it looked like an office building. And many of the suburban churches in our country look something like this. Of course, they're, they're new construction and they're out in the wide open spaces. It was very beautiful inside and did become a very beautiful setting for a wedding. At the seminary where both Pastor Song Min and I studied at Garrett Evangelical Seminary in Evanston, Illinois, you see the beautiful Gothic exterior, and that is the Chapel of the Unnamed Faithful, which was their large chapel. They also had a smaller one. This happens to be the very room in which I met my future wife, Anne, who was reading in a worship service, and I was sitting there, and I had no idea who she was. Uh, as you can tell, it's a beautiful sanctuary with remarkable stained glass windows. And then there is worship spaces such as this, our Pan Pine Lake Methodist Camp near Westfield, Wisconsin. And they are looking out at the lake as they have gathered here in the outdoor chapel for worship. A beautiful, beautiful setting indeed. And compare that with this, the, the Crystal Cathedral. Anybody recognize this? The Crystal Cathedral was the church built in the home church of Robert Schuler, who's uh, messages and worship services were broadcast for years. When I was at that little Anson church up north, there used to be a gentleman coming into church every Sunday morning at 11, and he says, you know, I've seen three online or three sermons on TV so far today, Pastor. I hope yours measures up. Well, one of them, <laughs> he got up early on a Sunday morning, and one of them was Robert Schuler. This has now been sold to the Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles, interestingly, and it's now the Catholic Cathedral of Los Angeles. Speaking of cathedrals, this is the Cathedral of St. Paul. It happens to be in St. Paul, Minnesota. I used to work just blocks away from this. It's named for the Apostle Paul, for whom the city was named. The, cat, the Cathedral of St. Paul sits on the highest hill of the city, which is interesting because they built the state capitol on the second highest hill. It says something about the founding of the city, and as you can see, it's a remarkable place of worship. Does anybody recognize this next church? Can you see the preacher far off in the distance on the screen? This is Joel Olstein's Lakewood Church in Houston. It used to be the Compact Center. It was the home for the NBA's Houston Rockets. And they built a new arena for their basketball team, and the Lakewood Church purchased this. And it uh, looks almost identical to the Cargill Church, I think. <laughs> and then uh, there has been a movement in some parts of the country for what's called house churches. And these are churches, perhaps the, uh, a, a church that's just beginning, that yet has not a building and, and, and not a lot of people. Uh, sometimes it's people who have... Uh, no church home, or perhaps they're traveling for a time, and, and churches meet in homes, which is very much like the early Christian movement of churches began. We did not have churches after Christ's resurrection. People often met in homes. And then, of course, there's churches that you are familiar with, in the upper left being one of our predecessor churches in downtown Janesville, the Cargill Methodist Episcopal Church, as well as this building in which you're now seated built, as we know, and opened for worship on Christmas Eve in 1960, an anniversary we just celebrated. And of course, here, we worship in different places. We worship in the sanctuary. We worship in the chapel. And for a time, we worshiped in the fellowship hall, particularly uh, whether it was for family worship or when this sanctuary was being renovated. David Barnhart is the pastor of St. Junia United Methodist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, and it's actually a network of house churches. It's not one building. It looks a little bit like what we just saw. And they describe their church as churches for sinners, saints, and skeptics who join God in the renewal of all things. And that statement is wonderfully inclusive because who is it one of those three? And in fact, most of us are all of those three, are we not? And we gather, we gather to become people of God who transform the world, according to our Methodist mission. And, and Dave Barnhart says, imagine if we describe the church this way, that about 2,000 years ago, a grassroots movement called The Way, and that's what the early Christian movement was called, it wasn't a church yet, they called it The Way, it appeared, and they were community organizers who met in homes and shared meals together. 
They followed teachings of a Jewish rabbi and professed a radical and simple set of practices, sharing resources and teaching that radically inclusive love and nonviolent justice could transform the world. And they believed that they could create a a whole new world, a whole new community, a whole new way of living, and that it would spread from place to place, like yeast spread through bread or like mustard weeds across an open field. And they called this, the the Bible calls this gathering the ecclesia. Before it ever mentions church, it, it calls it ecclesia. That's a Greek word. And it means those who are called out. Now, that sounded better than those who have been kicked out which also would have been true, and this was according to Dave Barnhart, because their Jewish members were kicked out of their synagogues for following Jesus, and their non-Jewish members were often kicked out of their homes. And the way they spoke about their founder, who we now know as Jesus the Christ, was mysterious and provocative. And they claimed that though he had been executed as a rebel, he was still alive and was still with them in their movement. This week's edition of the Upper Room Devotions called Disciplines, it it reflects on this time long before, long before this time, in fact, several centuries before Jesus. And at this point, David was the king, God's anointed king over Israel. We've heard of King David, of course. And, And David, David believed that this wonderful God who we worship deserved a house. Not the house of the house church that we we saw. God deserved a temple worthy of God. And, And God, on the other hand, wanted David to understand that only God builds things that last. Now, I pray that when the architects and builders constructed this church in 1959 and 60, they built it to last. So far, I think they're doing pretty well. In fact, we had to remove a beautiful old dying spruce tree a few weeks ago to help preserve the building so it didn't fall into these glorious windows. But I'm guessing the building could have withstood the blow. It's, it's a building built to last. But God said, no, the only things that truly last are the things that I build. And so David is mulling over, how can I honor God? He was, he was living in, in a palace, David was. But the center of worship then, well, it wasn't even a house, it was a tent. Again, this is seven centuries before Jesus. And so David consults with the prophet Nathan, because that's what you did, and they agree that it's time to build a proper temple before the Lord. So you have the scripture in your worship bulletin. It's on the back page. And and this is where we hear this story. It's from the second book of Samuel in the seventh chapter. And I'm going to read a segment of this from the fourth verse. So it describes this desire of David to build a temple. And it says, The word of the Lord came to Nathan, the prophet, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I haven't lived in the house in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. And wherever I have moved among the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why haven't you built me a house of cedar? Of course, God had not commanded that they would build such a house. God changed the focus from the building of a temple in which to worship to the line of the descendants of the people who would come to worship. Because David established a dynasty, a genealogy, a a long list of descendants who would eventually lead to Jesus' very birth. God put worship in its place. The place of worship is the human heart. And the place where human hearts come together in worship is where people gather. The sanctuary, the chapel, the cathedral, the house church, the arena or the school or the theater or the living room that is transformed into a place of worship. What is the place of worship that that holds your heart? Perhaps it is this very place. 
Yesterday, a beautiful young couple chose this place for their marriage ceremony. Connor Moyson, the daughter of this congregation, 275 people in this sanctuary. They chose this place. I'm not saying you can't have a sacred wedding outside of a church because I have officiated many, but they chose this place to be the site of their sacred wedding ceremony. You may, in fact, identify most with this place as a sacred worship gathering place. I have often, always, in fact, found churches to be home and inviting, but I grew up in the church. For many of you, maybe you've been to summer camp and you have special memories of worshiping in a lakefront chapel as you not only heard the word of proclaim, but you looked out across a lake with a cross and perhaps you have not grown up in a church and you walked into this place today feeling very awkward. Because if you haven't grown up in a church, it can seem very foreign. For those who haven't been introduced as to a church as they have grown up, a place of worship may not be comforting but imposing. It may not feel warm and inviting, but it might feel foreign and unfamiliar. The Cathedral of St. Paul, as I mentioned, sits on a tall hill in St. Paul, overlooking downtown St. Paul. It features this distinctive copper-clad dome on the outside. It's the third largest Catholic cathedral and the sixth largest church in the United States, by the way. The dome of the cathedral is 76 feet in diameter and 186 feet high. I don't know how tall this, this sanctuary is. The Cathedral of St. Paul feels a good bit taller. The exterior of this cathedral is granite. The interior walls are limestone, and those interior columns that you see are made of several types of marble. That is a house of worship that is resolute and solid. It took nine years to build. And it's a beautiful structure. And, and many people, many people have felt the power of God. On 9-11 that day, there was a, a spontaneous, of course, they didn't plan it. There was, they opened the church at noon because they just realized people needed to go to a place to find solace, comfort, and God in prayer. And the, and the city flocked to the cathedral, even if they weren't Catholic. Uh, 1,500 people just showed up because it was recognized as a place that, that was God's house. And, and the Bible is full of architectural imagery like this. And a lot of the, a lot of the Bible refers to, to building things up. But, but some of it refers to tearing things down. And I'm not speaking literally that the pillars of the cathedral should come down or the, or the granite walls should crumble. But take today's other passage, which you also have in your bulletin. This is from the New Testament letter to the Ephesians. And I, I'm just at verse 14. For Christ is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. I may have shared this story before, and if I haven't, I know I'll do it again because it was such a remarkable experience. When I was in seminary, I was interning at a little church. I'm not going to mention where it was. It wasn't a Methodist church, I will say that. Um, it was a little tiny church, and they needed somebody to preach on Sundays. And so I did it during seminary. It was a great experience. But literally, small little church, again, when it was full, they would have had 50 people. On this side was the Hatfields, and on this side was the McCoys. And I'm not exaggerating. It was one extended family here and one extended family here, and there was three people, God bless Chuck and Myrtle, and another person. They sat in the middle. They were literally Switzerland between these two families. And the only reason that church survived is that both sides were stubborn enough that they weren't going to let the other side win, so they kept showing up to church. I'm not sure that's what Jesus had in mind when he said, the Spirit is upon my church. But there was a wall, invisible wall, but there was a wall literally down the center aisle of that church. And Scripture would say Christ came to break down the dividing walls. And so a house of worship should be built of porous walls. And again, I'm speaking metaphorically, of course. The church needs to think of itself as having, as having a revolving door, one that welcomes people inside with all the excitement of when you used to walk into that revolving door in, at Marshall Fields at Christmas time, and you'd walk into this beautiful splendor, that people are welcome to come inside, not, not frightened, not, not afraid, and also a door that whisks people back out, right? 
that sends them out with encouragement and strength and support to go and be Christ in the world. God told King David, I haven't asked for a palace. I have asked for a people. That New Testament reading from Ephesians in verse 20 tells us that the foundation of our place of worship is not this foundation. The foundation of our place of worship is the people who have gone before us. If you've been a part of this church for any amount of time or a part of any church for any amount of time, you can identify somebody immediately who has gone before you that was pillar of faith for you, that laid a foundation for your life, if not the worship of this church. And it's not just the generations of the Cargill Church or the Methodist movement in Janesville that began in 1839, but the lineage that travels all the way back to the apostles of Jesus Christ. And that the cornerstone, you can still see the, the cornerstone of this building. If you go inside this entrance here, you can see the 1905 cornerstone. But the cornerstone of the church is Jesus himself. And if you understand architecturally how the cornerstone holds a building aligned and straight, you understand how, and this is from verse 21 in Ephesians, in Christ the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, into whom you also are built together spiritually in a dwelling place for God. You gathered here this day, whether you as young as Ada or as old as, I'm not saying it. All of us together, we are the dwelling place for God. We are. All of our hearts together. And we have gathered in this beautiful place, built for the express purpose for we to come together to be the dwelling place of God. So as I've now begun my second year here at Cargo. We will pay attention to the ways we worship. And of course, we've, we've had to come out of an unprecedented time, so we've had to consider all things, the space in which we worship, the, the order in which we worship, the, the role of music in the way we worship, uh, the, the rituals we have before and after worship, and we, we, we do not take any of them for granted. And we continue to pray, and, and we're looking towards September as sort of our second restart praying that we can continue to keep the, the virus at bay. And we look at the resource of our building and our beautiful grounds here at Cargill and, and understand how they provide a gathering place for God's people, a centering space for the spiritually seeking and a learning place for people of all ages. But even as we pay attention to what happens inside our building, we pray that our doors are wide and our windows allow us to look out on the world as much as to peer into the sanctuary, that our walls and our very church will not divide us, but will be porous to the people of our community, so that this Cargill church will be a sacred place to the community, for the community, and in the community. And we are the extension of this place. We are the foundation that reaches far beyond because you are the dwelling place of God. And together we multiply that dwelling place. Places of worship can be beautiful. They can be ornate. They can be simple. They can be large. They can be small. They can be outdoors. They can be indoors. If they are dedicated to worshiping God, they are beautiful. But the true temple of believers is the body of Christ. And we are the body of Christ. Interesting. <laughs> Body of God, 
Be seated. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for calling us your children. We thank you for Jesus Christ, who is our cornerstone and who dwells in and with us, full of grace and love to draw us to God in our daily lives. Fill us with your spirit and love when we are empty. Forgive us when we make mistakes and are wrong. Guide us when we wander and are lost. Protect us when we face evil and are in danger. Comfort us when we grieve and are tired. Heal us when we need peace and are disconnected. We offer our prayers for our friends and family members who are in need of your healing mercy. Dwell in them as you dwell in us, that others may dwell in your abiding presence and your steadfast love in our words and actions. Give us your guidance, your forgiveness, and courage to be at work in your kingdom. As our Savior, Jesus Christ, has taught us, we continue to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I am honored, we are delighted and honored at this time to welcome Ada Laskowski to come forward to, to invite Ada and uh, Elizabeth and Aaron to come as well as the godparents, Emily and Josh. Josh, would you come forward today? if you all paid such close attention. <laughs> Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of God, expressed through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And those receiving the sacrament of baptism, as Ada does this day, come into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Aaron and Elizabeth today are presenting this child for baptism. It's a sacred time in the life of these parents, of this child, and of this community of faith. Christian baptism is an acknowledgement of God's grace at work in the life of this child with the care of her mother and father, of her extended family, and under the nurture of this community of faith. It points to her personal response to that grace when she is able to respond for herself, which I think will not take long. 
Aaron and Elizabeth, what is the name given this child? Today, parents and other family members bring Ada James Laskowski to celebrate God's call on her life. And as you bring her this day, Aaron and Elizabeth, on behalf of Christ's Holy Church in this congregation, I ask you as parents, do you profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? And if so, please respond, I do. And will you accept as your responsibility and privilege to live your life so that Ada will, by your example and influence, seek to follow in the faith? And if so, please respond, with God's help, we will. With God's help, we will. And will you promise, as God gives you wisdom, to raise and nurture Ada in the Christian faith, bringing her to services of worship, making it possible for her to take part in religious education, and in ways open to you to help her grow in faith and love of God. And if so, please respond, with God's help, we will. Emily Baker and Josh Eastman. Godparents fulfill a special role in the life of a child in accepting this role of Godparents. You promise to participate in the life of this child doing everything in your power in the strength of God to assist the parents in the special nurture, spiritual nurture of this child. Will you pray for her and walk with her in the way of Christ to help her take her place within the life and worship of Christ Church? If so, please respond with God's help, I will. Thank you. Please join with me for the response of congregation. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Ada with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow in service to others. We will pray for Ada that she may be true a disciple who walks in the way that leads to a life. Amen. Emily Baker and Joshua, please come. And please pour water into fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We baptize by water and the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and Ada who receives it, to wash away her sin and clothe her in righteousness throughout her life, that dying and being raised by Christ, she may share in his final victory. Amen. Ada James Laskowski, I baptize you in the name of God the Father and Jesus the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> may the Holy Spirit work within you, Ada, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You know these people up here, right? I'd like you to meet the rest of your family. <laughs> Dear friends, this is Ada James Laskowski, the very newest member of Christ's Holy Church. <laughs> Let us pray. O oh God, grant that Ada, as she grows in years, may also grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may she ever be a true child of yours, serving you faithfully all of her days. Guide and uphold these parents that, by loving care, wise counsel, and holy example, 
They may lead Ada into the life of faith, whose strength is righteousness, and whose fruit is everlasting joy and peace. Now, may God, our Creator, Christ, our Savior, and the presence of the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep all of us now and forever. Amen. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite Lynn Cargis to come forward on behalf of the quilting ministry and an extension of the care and love of this congregation as she has a gift to present to Ada and her family. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you so much for being here with Ada. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Go now in peace and confidence as we are being built into a holy dwelling place by the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen.